So our second presentation uh, will be given by Rajiv Batra from the University of Michigan. Rajiv is going to present research that he and his colleagues have done on the topic of brand coolness. This is a trait, of course, that many marketers uh, covet, but exactly what it means and, and how to know if you or your competitors' brands have it, how you might actually engender it in your brands is, is not very clear. So thank you for uh, sharing your insights on this important topic, Rajiv. Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, everyone. Again, as Chris said, I'm Rajiv Batra from the University of Michigan. And along with the co-authors listed on this slide, I'm very pleased to be sharing with you today our findings about what kinds of perceptions can give a brand this mysterious quality of, uh, of brand coolness. Now, we all know that coolness can be very important to the marketing success of a brand in lots of industries. And Vinita was talking a lot about Facebook and social media, and Facebook used to be very cool once upon a time. Uh, it no longer is among young people. Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, uh, is much more cool. Of course, other, comp other competing social media brands like Snapchat and TikTok as well. But you may have, in fact, read yesterday that Facebook is now rebranding both Instagram and WhatsApp, and they're going to call it Instagram by, from Facebook and WhatsApp from Facebook because they're hoping some of this coolness of Instagram and WhatsApp will trickle back into Facebook. Uh, in other industries as well, such as apparel, uh, a brand like Levi's, which at one time was extremely cool, had 30% plus market share in the jeans business in the United States, uh, drop massively. You can see the graph there on the right. It's no longer that cool. Lululemon, on the other hand, uh, began as a small niche yoga clothing brand and is now a massive athleisure goliath. So coolness is very important to the success of, of lots of brands and lots of industries. I think that's, that's uh, I don't want to belabor that point here. Now, the obvious question then is, what is it that makes brands cool? And while there are lots of practitioner books on the subject and there's academic research on uh, specific niche small areas like coolness and technology uh, or coolness among people, there really hasn't been until this point a large-scale systematic effort to drill down into the nature of coolness to figure out what is it that makes brands cool. And th there is no scale on the different components that can make a brand cool, so you can measure how well your brand is doing versus competition on this all-important quality. So that's what we tried to do. And as our starting point, we took a definition that one of my co-authors, Caleb Warren, had come up with in 2014. Coolness is something that's subjective. It's dynamic. It changes. I'll be talking a lot about that in a few minutes. It's socially constructed. It's positive. And it has a lot to do with this notion of something being autonomous, autonomous being the idea that a person or a brand does what they want to do. They don't just follow the norm. So we said, well, let's begin there, but let's expand that, and let's try to see what other types of brand perceptions also have a role in shaping this overall brand coolness. So that became our goal in this uh, series of studies that we did. We began with qualitative research, and we began in Europe, because one of my co-authors, Sandra, is in Lisbon. And so we did focus groups. We did lots of depth interviews uh, in, in Europe. And then Caleb did some essay writing exercises in the United States. And we basically asked people, think of a brand that you think is cool. Think of a brand that you think is not that cool. And what is the difference? What makes some brands cool and others less cool? And we came up with, consumers came up with 10 attributes, 10 components that contribute to this overall notion of coolness. And it's on this slide, and I'll go through this slide uh, from the top in a clockwise kind of fashion. So, cool brands are seen as being original. They're creative. They're novel. They do new things. They're seen as being authentic. They're true to their own roots, their own heritage. Uh, cool brands are often rebellious. This is the autonomy aspect that the definition had mentioned one slide ago. Cool brands are often linked to some subculture where they have their origins. 
cool brands sometimes can also have a lot of status and prestige and be ritzy and glamorous and sophisticated. Now, I want to mention here, it's not that every brand has all of these, but these are all different pieces of what make a brand cool. And so some brand will have a combination of these. A cool brand also often is cool because it's aesthetically appealing. The design is fantastic. Uh, cool brands have this aura of energy and excitement and dynamism uh, around them. Cool brands are seen as offering their consumers extraordinary quality as products or services. And what, but what that means is they're not just a little bit better, but they're massively better than their competition. Cool brands often also have this, this iconic quality. And by that, we mean there's a lot of symbolic content in that brand that's widely shared uh, in, in the population. Uh, cool brands can also be very popular and trendy. So these are 10 different components that can, tr can contribute to the overall coolness of a brand, and that's what we found in the qualitative research. Then we moved on to quantitative research. We did uh, more than eight studies, more than 2,000 people in both Europe and the United States, and we asked them to come up with examples of brands that were cool and not cool, and then to rate them on lots of different adjectives, and we tried to validate um, uh, the scales uh, to measure these components. So you see here the scale that we finally came up with that we validated according to lots of uh, psychometric criteria. So for instance, uh, let's take the uh, component of being, of being rebellious. So you'd have the, the consumer would read the brand on, is this brand rebellious? You know, uh, agree, disagree kind of a scale, five point scale. Uh, is the brand defined in, the, in their perceptions? Is the brand not afraid or afraid to break rules? Is it nonconformist? So the combination of those four scales then measure how rebellious the brand is, is seen as uh, overall. We also had consumers rate outcome measures, metrics that marketers would consider important. So in that, in that set, we had things like brand favorability, liking for the brand, uh, willingness to pay, how much would consumers be willing to pay for the brand? Uh, would they advocate the brand and engage in positive word of mouth about the brand to other people? Uh, what the extent to which they would they love this brand? The extent to which they had connections with it in terms of being close to their sense of self and so on. And what we found was that our 10 components of coolness together could explain as much as 70% of the variation in these outcome measures of importance to, uh, to, uh, to marketers. So clearly it's a very important uh, kind of construct here. Now I mentioned earlier this idea that coolness is dynamic, it changes brands, it doesn't just stay fixed. So then we did uh, further research on this dynamic aspect and the way we did this is the context was urban streetwear, and we spoke to 148 members of an online community. In fact, it was Reddit, and there's a subreddit on urban streetwear. And we began by asking these people to nominate a brand for three categories, three types of brands. And one was brands that were niche cool. We define niche cool as a brand that they thought was cool, but that the mass market did not yet. Then we set a brand that is mass cool, which is other people think it's cool, but I don't necessarily. And then we had a third category of brands that are clearly uncool. And so the examples that we got, these are the samples, in the uncool category was Skechers and Gap. In the niche cool, there's a, an apparel brand called Steady Hands, and it's so secretive that in fact the logo is not on the, on the garment, it's inside and only the wearer can see the logo. There's another brand called Cav Empt that I'd never heard of, and you probably haven't either. That's a CE over there. And then the mass cool is this clothing brand called Supreme that's pretty big these days, and then Nike, of course. So we had people, once they gave us these examples, we said, now let's rate each of these brands on our 10 components. And then we compared these average ratings across the three types of, of brands. And so what we found was that the brands that were niche cool were rated by these people to be more original, 
more authentic, more rebellious, and more subcultural. Both niche school and mass school brands scored high on the quality of being extraordinary, having energy and excitement and dynamism, having this aesthetic design appeal, and having status, which is the glamour prestige aspect. Interestingly enough, though, the mass school brands, and this actually is sort of obvious, uh, the mass school brands were seen as being more popular. They're more mass, therefore they're more common, more popular, and also more iconic in terms of having a symbolic content that was widely seen in the marketplace. So these are how the brands differed on some of the 10 components. In terms of the outcome measures, the niche cool brands scored highest on liking and attitudes, on brand love, on self-brand connection, and on willingness to pay. So even though it's a niche brand and not too many people are buying the brand, those that buy the brand love it and are willing to pay more for it. Brands that are mass cool, on the other hand, obviously because they're mass in the marketplace, consumers are more familiar with them, they see them around more in terms of media presence, so brand exposure is higher. Um, there's more word of mouth. People talk about them more because they're more public, more visible. Uh, and the price premium is higher. Now, this is a very important, interesting finding that the price premium is higher in the mass school uh, brand category than the niche school brand category. So this has some implications for how you manage a brand. Uh, it, this suggests that if you're a, a brand marketer, that and if you're interested in margins and, and revenue, that in fact you might want your brand to be a mass brand, not just a niche brand. I mean, we'll talk more about that later. Now, this has the work we've done has lots of implications for managing and creating brand coolness. So, where do you begin? Well, you use the validated scale that we've come up with with our 10 components and you can measure how well your brand is doing on each of these 10 components and compare that to how well your competitors are doing on those 10 components. You can also take that same scale and have consumers not just rate the brands on coolness, but also rate the brands on the outcome metrics that you care about. It might be purchase intent or repurchase or willingness to pay. And then you can actually run some kind of you know, regression analysis to figure out which coolness components are more important in driving your outcome metrics of interest. So which of these coolness components is more important in driving purchase intent or willingness to pay? And then if you have that data on, on these importance weights and you have the data on how well you, you're doing versus competition, you then can fig figure out where you need to improve uh, versus competition. So that's the diagnosis and strategy piece. Then you get to tactics. So let's say you've figured out you're weak on something where you need to be stronger in terms of these 10 components. You've got to figure out how you raise your brand's perceptions on that particular coolness component. So original, you're not seen as original. Well, clearly what you now need to do is to do something that is not just a minor tweak on what, the, on what the competition is doing, but something substantively, massively different and better. So in the smartphone category, for instance, the example is Samsung now coming out with this folding, foldable smartphone. They had a glitch. I know the technical glitch that they fixed now. But that's an example of something really original. Uh, remind people about your authenticity, your values, your heritage, your history. And, and the best brand example I can think of here is Patagonia in the outdoor apparel category. You see there the picture from Fortune magazine where Patagonia was called the coolest company on the planet, and that's the founder of Patagonia, shown there, Yves Chouinard. And Patagonia is known for its commitment to sustainability and the environment and so on. And so the way they, they burnish that and reinforce that is marketing campaigns such as the one you see there, where they're actually telling people, don't waste your money and, and the planet's resources by buying a new jacket if your old jacket will... will will serve. So if the old jacket is torn, send it to us, we'll fix it, and you don't need to buy a new jacket. So that's one example of how the authenticity message is being strengthened. Make your brand seem rebellious. Uh, that's the autonomy idea. So that's the whole story, the Steve Jobs, Apple positioning. Think different. You're not IBM. Uh, you're different from IBM and so on. 
uh, iconic is tell a brand story that gives your brand the symbolic meaning. So examples would be, you know, Disney with the whole childhood association or Coca-Cola that would link Coke to Santa Claus and, you know, all those family values and so on. Energy comes from innovation. Aesthetic appeal, obviously, is design, uh, product design and communications design and retail design that create the sense of uh, aesthetic appeal. High status comes not only from premium pricing, but also the way in which you uh, co-brand along with, uh, for example, retailers, where you distribute your brand, the media into which you place your brand, your endorsers, things like that will give you, your brand this, this premium pricing kind of status. Rebellious. Um, I think a good example is Nike, and we can maybe talk about this a little later, but how is Nike, despite its large size, it's one-third, one third, one 30, 40% of the entire athletic goods market globally, how do they maintain this rebellious persona? Well, part of that is this, this linkage, continuous linkage with personalities like Colin Kaepernick, which despite the divisive nature of that linkage, uh, does connect Nike again and again to people with this rebellious, in-your-face kind of edgy uh, attitude. Subcultural, obviously, is link your brand to some sub subculture. So, you know, Harley Davidson being in these bikers' rallies in Sturgis, South Dakota, is an example of maintaining the subcultural linkage. Uh, extraordinary, again, is the same breakthrough innovation idea. And popular would be trendy, and that kind of gets to the kinds of things that Vanita was talking about, where you get people in social media, these big influencers, talking about your brand and spreading the message about your brand. So these are ways in which you improve the rating of your brand on the key attributes. And finally, uh, this is again the life cycle of brands that we see. Brands begin by being niche to a small segment. Uh, look at Lululemon, which began as this yoga apparel brand. Uh, pretty niche in the beginning, but then now they become this mass cool brand. They pretty much dominate at leisure. Uh, Levi's began as a niche school brand for cowboys and gold miners in the American West in the 1840s. Then with the baby boomers, it became a mass school brand. But Levi's has now gone on to the third group, third category of becoming uncool among lots of segments. Uh, and that's something you don't want to happen to your brand. So you've got to make sure that if you become mass cool, you maintain that edginess that, that keeps your brand cool in the, in the long run. So that, I think, is where I want to end, and I'm going to open it up now for questions. Thank you for sharing your insights on this important topic, Ajit. It's, it's, I think it's the, the whole research program that, that on this topic is, um, and the, the work that you've done qualitatively and quantitatively, it has a lot of insight. So let's take your questions. Um, Again, if you'd like to ask questions, make sure that you type them into the Q&A tab, not the studio chat tab. We missed a few um, in the, during the first presentation. So make sure you type them into the Q&A tab on the screen uh, on, the, on the left side. So um, let me start with actually um, one of the questions that I had when, when you were talking, Rajiv, which is, mm -hmm. Should all brands actually care about being cool? Is this something that is it sort of uh, is is it you know universally desirable? Well, I think it's more important among some segments and some categories, and so segments where how people appear to others is is very important. Um, brands competing for those segments need to be. Uh, especially cool. And then in terms of categories or industries, uh, products or services that are consumed publicly in a socially visible manner tend to be ones where brand coolness would be more, more important. So obviously industries are things like apparel or liquor um, or automobiles, for instance. Uh, but these days people are using even other newer product categories to signal to others uh, who they are, what they are. I mean, you think of people going to restaurants and uh, doing Instagram posts immediately of, you know, what they're eating and where and with whom. And so that's, that's, that's you know, hospitality is now becoming a category where you have to be cool. So um, mm -hmm. I, I guess it's, in, it's increasing over time is, is the way I would, I would generalize. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So here's a question from Malik. Um, how does the concept of coolness develop among different age groups? Is it the same level of importance or does it have different qualities, say for 50 plus versus teenagers? 
I think, uh, first of all, yes, there are differences across age cohorts. So younger people that are establishing their own identity, their own sense of self, teenagers, for them it's, it's especially important. Uh, but even in older age cohorts, 50 plus or retiring boomers, it's still important, but maybe less so. So first of all, there is an age cohort difference. I think the nature of coolness is very important across generations and what the kinds of products that one generation would use to signal coolness might not matter to another at all. So for example, I'm involved in a research study right now where we are finding that among teenagers, the brand of, of smartphone that they own is very important to establish their coolness among their high school peers. And maybe somebody 50 plus, you know, that, that thought wouldn't cross their mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what, here's a question from Joe. Um, as a manager, do, do I want my brand to be niche cool or mass cool? What are, what are sort of the issues there that are important for me to think about as I, as I focus on that choice? I think it's, it depends on the strategic objectives of that company and its resources. Uh, it probably takes fewer resources to have a niche cool brand, to create and manage a niche cool brand, than it would to create and manage a mass cool brand. Uh, with niche cool, obviously the volumes are lower. Uh, but the target uh, segment, the people that buy your niche cool brand are probably going to be more loyal. So you have to spend less money on retention. Uh, the margins might be higher. Uh, so I think it all depends on your the, the size of the business you want. If you want to be a big player in a big market, then you probably need to have a mass school brand. But if you are a, a company with limited resources, then a niche school brand strategy might make more sense. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other, so here's, a, here's another a question from a different show. Uh, that asks about what are some other, do you have any other recommendations? And maybe it would be helpful to do this, with, you know, within the, maybe the context of a case study if you have one in mind. What are some, any other recommendations for further developing brand coolness? And you could decide whether you want that to be niche or, or mass. Because I think he, he asked an additional question about company resources, but I think you've just answered that in the previous response. So what about developing brand coolness? Yeah, I think uh, this is where the previous presentation becomes very irrelevant. The you, there was a time when to make a brand cool, you had to use mass media uh, in a big way, big stars, mass media, and so on. And I think today with the growth of social media and the extreme fragmentation of media and audiences, uh, it's easier for brands to develop uh, a perception of coolness and a following among a small niche audience using you know using social media and then to grow that over time so I think the task is arguably cheaper and easier today for marketers than it was uh, you know decades ago so uh, in terms of strategy I, to me it would make sense to be, begin on a small scale niche brand and then over time grow that into a mass cool brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Erica has a question about, and I think I know the answer, but she asks about, did you use, did you code the ads um, to see how they contributed? And also, you know, maybe does do platforms vary in terms of the how they contribute to brand coolness? I think you asked consumers directly to rate the brand coolness, but maybe you can address the idea of the linkages to advertising or the benefits of being on one platform over another. Yeah, so we didn't, in our research, we didn't address that specific question. We didn't ask people to tell us what they thought made the brand cool, what kinds of media platforms had the brand been on that made it seem cool today and so on. No, we didn't do that in the research. But I would, I would say that Clearly, uh, coolness does depend, as, as, it, as do other branding associations, they do depend on co-branding and linkages. So if, if your brand is seen in media that are considered more cool, uh, if they are used by 
endorses or influences that are seen as more cool, if they are placed in distribution channels that are seen as more cool, then that coolness of the channel, of the media platform, of the endorser rubs off and transfers to the brand. So I think the the marketing strategist has to first figure out what media, what endorsers, what distribution channels are seen as more cool by that target audience mm. and then place your brand uh, in them and with them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me too. Malik has a follow-up question about, and this really seems to be a fundamental challenge, which is how to retain your consumers, you know, if you're niche cool, as you go to, as you start mer emerging into a mass cool brand, how do you hold on to those consumers that loved you when you were niche? Because, you know, they presumably don't, they, they want to be associated with something unique or differentiated, and if it becomes kind of adopted by everybody, that it may lose that quality. So what's, what's the strategy there? Yeah, um... I'm not sure I have an answer. I mean, that's a challenge for sure. You know, I, I think the other challenge linked to that same question that Malik is asking is how do you prevent a mass cool brand from becoming uncool, not just mm. losing its niche coolness, but how do you prevent it from slipping into uncoolness? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, that's, that's a challenge as well. And I think Nike, again, is a very instructive example. It's really interesting how Nike, despite its massive size, still has this aura of rebelliousness, the whole attitude that, that Nike was born with, that, that Phil Knight gave it when he began with, you know, not just Michael Jordan and Andre Agassi and, and John McEnroe, but all the other athletes. But but uh, Nike's always maintained this, this connection with athletes who have this in-your-face persona. And that's how they maintain their edginess as a brand, despite their massive size. And the Colin Kaepernick example that I gave is is a great great uh, illustration of that. But that's what brands need to do: is to consciously maintain that linkage to what made them cool in the first place. Mm. Yeah, that sounds that sounds right to me. And maybe Malik's question is the basis of the next project because it does seem very tricky. And I know there's been some research done that looks at, you know, consumers pulling away as brands become mass. Um, right. So it seems like a very big challenge. So it's a very, it's a, it's a nice question to ask and um, something that we can, we can ask future researchers uh, to, to focus on because it is a big challenge. So, well, thank exactly. you very much, Rajiv. We had, these are great questions, great engagement, uh, super topics. So thanks again for participating in the webinar. Thank you. Our pleasure.